What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. I am your host, John Santiago, and in this episode, I'm talking with Monty Weaver. Monty is a digital strategist who teaches all things tech and social media on his YouTube channel. And in 2020, Monty took the plunge into YouTube and surprised himself with how fast his channel took off. He went from zero to a few thousand subscribers in a matter of months after some of his videos on a few trending topics at the time blew up. In this episode, Monty and I chat about his journey on YouTube so far. We also discuss how he's leveraging new video platforms like Amazon Live to make money through his content. You don't want to miss this. Stay locked in. You're tuned into the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. All right, Monty. Thanks for coming on the podcast, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is cool, you know, like we've we've met before, you know, we've talked um obviously about you know your experience and in, in getting into youtube um really this year in 2020 um and and the success that you've had like in a short amount of time can you just kind of take me back to like the origins of of your youtube channel and and what got you started in it i remember from our our conversation before we started this podcast that you had mentioned to me that you're you're not typically the kind of guy who who likes to be in front of the camera. You're you're more of like a behind the scenes guy. But this year has been a year in which you've you've taken the forefront in terms of being in front of the camera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, prior to 2020 and getting into YouTube, you know, I spent a lot of time on Facebook more so for posting and live streaming to really teach entrepreneurs and businesses how to leverage this technology and the social media thing and when i was kind of looking back at the end of 2019 i was like man some of the content that i've taught has been really valuable and people have reached out to me trying to refer back to some of the content that i had put out early earlier that year and even years prior and it wasn't until that moment where i was like man i have no way of showing people where that content is on that platform and i need to really consider going over to youtube and so january 2020 i really made that shift over to youtube just to put more of my content on that platform it was the same type of content teaching people how to use cameras and equipment and social media and these tutorials but I, I wasn't able to, you know, get the content seen before. So putting it on YouTube has definitely been beneficial because when people are looking for it, they can find it. And, and like you said, yeah, like I like being behind the scenes. And so I was OK with, you know, not everybody finding my uh, videos and, you know, being that person that's always been the person that's putting the cables together and setting up for everybody else. And so YouTube really has been this platform where I'm at the forefront now and people are able to see who Monty is and what Monty does when they come across our videos. And, you know, I've had videos now on YouTube that I put up at the beginning of this year. I looked at one has over 200,000 views. Another one has over 90,000 views and it's content that I've taught before, but it wasn't until I put it on YouTube that it actually got this traction and the channel's just been growing crazy ever since. I know the story you've told me before about, you know, your start in in technology and interest in in audio and video production, but obviously for the listeners and the people maybe watching the podcast, can you kind of give us that that story or that backstory into how you you got interested in all of this kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I grew up in the church where uh you either had to sing in the choir or be in a play. Uh, I wanted to do the tech stuff so that, that kind of kept me out of the, the front of the stage. It kept my attention really. And I just gravitated to uh, back then we had the tape ministry and overhead projectors. And so I kind of gravitated into that tech space and then it evolved to actually recording the sermons and sending them to the TV stations and editing those videos. So I really kind of developed my passion for the technology in the church setting. And then growing into the corporate world, it just evolved into help desk, you know, troubleshooting. And 
after I got to a certain point, I really wanted to help the business owners leverage it. And so I would find a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs, they just didn't know how to set up Facebook profiles. They didn't know how to turn on the camera and, and get proper lighting for a video. They weren't using it for advertising correctly, you know, just trying to get their word out, the, the message about what it is that they do. And so I was able to really just take all these skills that I've learned over the years and make it simple so people can understand it, one, and then actually apply it and start to execute on it to, to accomplish the goals that they're really trying to accomplish. So starting real young, just you know, gravitating to, can you help me fix my computer? all the way up till now where we're putting together these home studios, right? Cause we're, we're in that new normal um, where everybody is, has to have some type of home office setup now. And now seeing that evolution over the years has been awesome. Well, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Just to kind of hear where, where you came from and, and where you're headed um, in terms of just learning all of these things, like were there any particular people that you followed? Were you were you somebody I imagine that, you know, you were somebody who was teaching yourself a lot of these these technical things on your own, as well as maybe, you know, working with some people who are a little bit more knowledgeable than you at your church. But I'm just kind of curious about the process of learning um, all of these technical things. Yeah, a, a lot of it is online, some form or fashion um, that I've learned. And, and YouTube is a, a, one of the main resources now that I use for, uh, you know, just trying to see what's the new equipment out there and getting reviews of what people like, what they don't like. But when it comes down to like the, the tactical part of it, it's actually executing on it. It's just trying to figure it out. I, I have a piece of equipment or I have a piece of software. Let me start playing around with it and see what works and what doesn't work. And clicking the buttons. I, I know a lot of times people get scared to click buttons because they think they might break something. Well, sometimes you might break something, but sometimes it might help you figure out what not to do when you get into certain situations. I was actually doing a, a, an Amazon Live today um, on their platform and I had a, I, I plugged in a microphone and all of a sudden my camera stopped working. And so because I've played with it before, because I've experienced the problem, it allowed me to keep going and, and adjust and not just have to feel, oh my goodness, I have to shut down everything. What's going on? You, you know, if you've ever done live video, you know that anything can happen. But if you've, if you've played with it before, it allows you to learn things that work, things that don't work, and you can kind of get through it. So learning from YouTube, you know, people that are on that platform, learning from forums, you know, I loved jumping into forums for different softwares. If you're just trying to figure out if something's possible or how to do something, chances are somebody has an answer out there somewhere for it. Manufacturers are a great place to go to. Is if you got a new piece of equipment and you don't quite understand it, they're really responsive and letting you know how to best use that particular piece of equipment. And so I always encourage people just to dive into it, start playing around with it and see what you like about it, what works and what doesn't work. So when you get into these situations, because technology is technology, when you get to these situations, um, you don't feel like you have to fumble or, you know, you're doing something wrong because chances are it's not always going to be that person, that individual. It could just be, you know, that learning process that we all go through. What about in terms of some of those YouTube creators or channels that that kind of influenced you on your own journey to to becoming a creator yourself on the platform? Were there any in particular who you followed to kind of give you some inspiration or some guidance? Yeah, I, I love Think Media, Sean Cannell and those that the whole entire team over there. Uh, they're probably the number one tech channel that I watch. Um, I love Tom Buck. He's the Enthusiasm Project. He's a, more of a newer channel that I like to watch. And so these these guys and ladies that are on the platform, they definitely give you inspiration uh, when, when you actually try to create. Um, I'm not a creative by nature. Um, that's why I outsource video editing because I, I know what I see in my head, but it doesn't translate. You know, I'm a technician. I like to take the equipment into software and make it operate the way it's supposed to. But, you know, on YouTube, when you're creating, you know, I look for inspiration. What what are they using? What what are they doing? The stories that they're telling through video, 
Um, you know, some of the equipment, a lot of the equipment, matter of fact, that I have right now is because I found some other creator using it versus just going to a shopping cart and just, you know, what do I want? Now, I saw creators using this light or this camera or this lens, and that helps you get a good idea of what what your uh, setup can be like or what your outcome can be like ahead of time so that you don't feel like you're just picking random things because recommendations are powerful um, and seeing someone the, the seeing of it uh, actually allows you to you know benefit better than just someone verbally telling you hey go check this this out but if you can see it on somebody's youtube channel you know, it just definitely brings it to life. I think it's really cool and interesting that you, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I, you, you kind of approach YouTube from like with already like a business mindset, it, it in in tow, right? Like there are a lot of people who maybe they start on YouTube or they want to start a YouTube channel just because they want to, you know do something creative or artistic and whatnot. And and for you, like really this was a platform for you to kind of launch or or promote your services essentially as as a tech consultant, right? But now do you find it kind of evolving a little bit more than 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 just, you know, generating business for your consulting services? Yeah, a hundred percent. I came into YouTube as a as what can I leverage this for for business and it was the exposure it was the you know tutorials online that would lead to someone buying a course or someone reaching out to me to schedule a consultation session so it was definitely going into it with that business mindset first but yeah it has evolved um i didn't expect my channel to grow as fast as it did um i didn't expect to go from like zero to uh, like 10,000 in August and now I'm approaching 15,000. It's just unheard of for channels to grow that fast. You know, it's just not normal. And when I, when I started doing it, you know, I didn't expect it to grow that fast. So in my mind, I was just, let me just put up tutorial videos to help people. But now it's become its own business in itself. The, my business of YouTube where you know, I'm monetized on the channel. So every time I upload a video, there's monetary compensation. Um, now, when I upload a video, I have businesses and companies and brands looking at my videos and I'm getting sponsorship opportunities and brand deals. And, you know, I didn't expect that part of it to happen. So not only has it increased my business for consulting and tech, but it's also become a business of its own as well. Yeah, it's like it's it's diversifying your income streams, basically, right? Because like you said, you had essentially before this, most of what you were doing was consulting, correct? And then now I've seen you, you're, you're launching or you have launched like a couple online courses, which I, I, I really would love to talk to you about that process later on in this conversation. But it's it's cool to hear you say that like, now you're getting brand deal opportunities. Has that just been, has that just been like companies, agencies, um, or actual businesses themselves just reaching out to you over email and pitching you on, on these opportunities? Exactly. Like I, I, I did. This was part of the reason when I shifted over to YouTube and I saw that happen. I was like, okay, yep, YouTube is a great place for me. Um, I remember doing a, a video review of a microphone, a wireless microphone that I was using because I was doing some speaking, lunch and learn. So I wanted to record myself. So if you're a one person operation, you gotta be, uh, you gotta figure out how to do it yourself. So I bought me a, a low cost wireless microphone, had my camera sitting in the back of the room and I started to use this microphone for recording. And so one day I was on Facebook and I, and I recorded a video talking about the microphone and I put it up and then, you know, a few people watched it. But then I took that same video of the microphone and I put it on YouTube and that company actually saw my video. And so they've reached out to me. They said, hey, I love the, the video you did. Um, would you mind reviewing another microphone that we have? And so that was my first uh, awakening that, okay, there is something here on this YouTube thing that I'm gonna dive into. And so they sent me a microphone free of charge. Can you do a video? Well, sure, this is something that I can talk about. I love talking about this stuff. So I got the microphone and I did a video and, ever, and I've actually received three more microphones this year from them as well. And so that was amazing. You know, it was just a simple email. Can you review this video? And that's how all my brand deals have actually been. Um, 
live streaming companies have reached out to me. I've done videos for them on their behalf. And it's nice to be able to be compensated for things that you're already going to do anyway. And I encourage people that go down into YouTube world is to think about those companies that you dream of working with because you know that's how I've landed two awesome deals is just already doing videos about their products because I already used them and then they found my videos on YouTube and then they just sent me an email reached out I have lights behind me here that I still got the review that I was sent the other day so it, a lot of opportunities have come um, just by putting the information on the right platform is that kind of surreal? Like, I mean, because if you think about it, I, I've talked about this with some other creators as well, just the idea of, you know, brand sponsorships and brand deals and whatnot. And it's, you know, it's it's really not like a new idea, right? It's just, it's now that it's it's at this like really micro level. Um, but before, I mean, this is no different than like Michael Jordan getting sponsored by Nike or whatnot, or like other professional athletes or actors and actresses getting deals. It's just now that like, if you just start on YouTube or, or any other platform really, but YouTube is one of the best for this, like you have these opportunities where you're essentially an endorser for these brands and products. So again, back to my original question, is it, is it kind of surreal to think that like this is a way that you can make money and, and make income for yourself going into like the 2020s? You know, it's like when you see stuff or you hear people talk about it, it and some things just seem so far off and like, I'll never get there. It's surreal. I, I would never think that products that I've used or company that I've been using they would actually reach out to me, little old me, and say, hey, we want to work with you. We, we want you to have this. And all you have to do is talk about it. You know, that it is surreal. And, and being able to now work with people um, that are able to capitalize on the same thing. You know, part of part of what I do is, you know, help other businesses leverage this social media thing. And so when I started teaching about YouTube to my audience, I also stumbled upon it uh, across Amazon Live earlier this year. And so I started to tap into that platform as well. And I have two people now that I'm working with, they're on Amazon Live and they've both gotten sponsorship brand deals. Toys, one lady, she teaches uh, financial or uh, literacy uh, for kids and she's gotten toys. I have another friend of mine, he's also a client of mine, and he's gotten microphones from a different company on Amazon, and they just got on the platform. So it's amazing that these companies are reaching out to smaller individuals with, you know, we're not the Michael Jordans of the world, but they've noticed that we are leveraging video, we're putting content out there, and we're starting to grow these audiences of people that like it, what we have, um, like who we are as a person and yeah it's it's been an amazing journey so far and now to see other people like right behind me getting the same type of offers and deals i have one lady she's in uh, the caregiving industry and a company has reached out to her and actually brought her in as a full partner and she only has 700 subscribers on youtube and so you don't need thousands and thousands of thousands of people to actually work with these companies that people recognize and know. Yeah, that's that's one of the the big reasons um, why I wanted to talk to you because again, as you mentioned, you, your channel at this point during this interview, you're at around fifteen thousand subscribers. You know, and I think there's a there's a false belief or perception amongst people, maybe when they're getting started with YouTube. Or, or maybe it's it's a reason for them to to not get started is thinking, oh, well, I probably have to have like a million subscribers in order to actually like make money doing this or or turn it into a career for myself or turn it into a side hustle for myself. And you're like living proof that, no, you you don't need to have a huge audience. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, you just have to get started and, and people that that like what it is that you talk about or uh, your industry, you know, they will find you. Um, and, and when they find you, they're, everybody's looking for content. We're all looking to learn something new or see the new hot thing out. You know, PlayStation 5 just dropped the other day and I'm looking on YouTube and I'm like, there's so many people that are watching. And I was literally watching a guy, he had 10,000 live viewers just talking about 
PlayStation 5 coming out, you know? So there was no, you know, teaching value, but these audiences, this is what these companies want. If you can have an audience, then you have a voice and they're willing to, you know, it, it doesn't cost them that much. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, they're paying millions and millions of dollars to these, uh, these athletes and these, uh, actors and actresses to endorse a product or service, you know, they can definitely reach out to us that have smaller audiences because we have a, a tight group of people that really like what it is that we do and they, they value our opinions too. So with some of these companies um, that have sent you some products, um, they're, they're providing you the product and then essentially the monetization from it, is it affiliate, affiliate links basically? Yeah, so depending on the structure of the email or the of the offer, some come with affiliate links. So they might just be affiliate link only, but they'll give you a higher commission than a typical affiliate. Someone that would just go to the website and sign up for the affiliate program, they'll actually give you more than what that typical affiliate commission would be. Um, some of them give you product and then discounts on other products. Um, I love the fact that, you know, you can negotiate a little bit too. So maybe I want a product and monetary compensation so you can go back and forth and, you know, understanding your value is super important when you start to work with brands. That's something I've learned very, very quickly is don't undercut yourself because you have value, especially when these brands aren't on the platforms that, you know, you don't see certain companies with a large YouTube audience or Amazon live presence. So what they're doing is reaching out to us that do have these audiences that are willing to take the time to record a video, edit a video, get actors for your video, you know, film in 4K and have a nice microphone and lighting. So they're reaching out to us. So these brand deals come structured a myriad of different ways. Um, some equipment I get and if I don't use it, I resell it. So that's monetization there as well because if I had a room full of stuff, I don't know what I would do because I need some space to work. But, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can monetize it. Um, affiliates, the actual products, uh, no charge for the services. So they give you me lifetime access to use their platforms. So those monthly reoccurring fees that none of us like to pay, you know, those kind of go out the window. And so there's different things that you can ask for. Uh, when a company reach out to you, you don't have to just take that initial deal. You can ask, ask for more um, value um, so that you can definitely make it worth your time. Do these companies have like specific KPIs or for, this is like a marketing term, but like key performance indicators that they want you to hit or are they just come into you and say, hey, we just want you to make a video, like create the content and and that's all we really need. Yeah, so I've never reached out at this point during this interview, I've never reached out to a company and say, hey, I would like to work with you. They've all come to me. And so none of them have come with a KPI at all. They've just said, hey, the most I've gotten asked for is a video review on YouTube and a review on Amazon. And I've had one actually say, can you give us a one hour Amazon Live? And that's, that's the KPI. So there was no analytic data. I had to send them how big my audience was or, you know, how often they click a link. So I didn't have to send any of that type of information. And so if a company and brand does reach out to us as the creator, you definitely have a little bit more leverage where you don't feel like my audience isn't big enough or what if this video doesn't do well, um, like some other videos, you don't feel like you have that pressure on you because they're reaching out to you. So obviously there was something that they saw about you specifically that was that made them willing enough to reach out and uh, want to do a deal. I'm curious, too, about the negotiating negotiation aspect of it. Right. Like you mentioned that, you know, this is this is something you've learned a lot, you know, throughout this whole process of, of really ramping up your efforts on YouTube in 2020. Um Maybe could you start with some of the the mistakes that you made early on in that process um, with with brands and companies that that wanted to offer you deals? Yeah. So because it happened so fast, I didn't have the time to do that research that we all like to do. Um, the, I remember the, the very first one that reached out to me was a microphone company and they said, can you do a review? And so I was just excited. Someone reached out. They saw me and I got their attention. And so absolutely i'll do it but then you, you you forget to factor in that it takes time 
It takes time to record that video. It takes time to edit that video. It takes time to get it uploaded on YouTube and you gotta optimize it so that it can get found in search. And so when you're working on certain projects with brands, it takes you away from your actual business or your actual job where you are able to monetize because if you spend an hour creating a video, that's one less hour that you have to actually generate revenue from the thing that actually generates revenue for you. And so initially, you know, it's, it's awesome because, you know, you get something for free or, um, and you can, you know, produce a video or a blog post or whatever that, um, ask or requirement is of them. But as you start to get more, you definitely need to make sure that you compensate for your time. And so I undervalued what my time was worth early on. I didn't ask for enough. Um, I, I had one deal in place where they wanted three videos and uh, the very same week uh, there was a, a YouTube video that I saw that talked about this is how much you should ask for in your brand deals. And when I listened to the video, I was just so disappointed in myself. I didn't ask for enough. You know, I thought it was too much. Little old Monty, I can't ask for that much, but you know, undervaluing yourself is something you don't want to do early on. Um, and giving yourself enough time to produce, you know, what it is that they want. Um, you know, some offers, they say, can you do something within seven days? You know, so you definitely want to look at your calendar and make sure that you have enough time to fulfill that, um, that ask or that responsibility that you have to do. So those would be the two different, two major things is just don't undervalue yourself, you know, you know, value yourself that that's the main thing. And then just give yourself enough time. Um, because you know, if these platforms aren't your full time job, then you don't want to spend so much time where it's not producing anything for you. You really want it to work on your behalf. And as a creator, you know, that is the goal is to make it work for you, us. Yo, Monty, what are some of the things that, um, you try to ask for now in some of these, these deals that you negotiate with, with, with these companies, are there, are there certain, I guess, certain facets or, or elements that are like, this is a must have, or, you know, I'll, I'm willing to walk away from the deal. Yeah. I, I have walked away from quite a few already. Um, even early on in this process, it's nice to, to be noticed, but there's some deals that I have walked away from, you know, if it doesn't line up with my brand or my message, then those are offers that I walk away from. So for example, I had a company reach out and they are more in the e-commerce space and that's not really who my audience is. They're not really online e-commerce people per se. They might use equipment or, you know, need to understand social media for promotion, but they don't necessarily need my assistant when it comes to building an e-commerce website. That's just not something I can help them with. And so when that brand reached out to me, it really didn't make sense for me to get the free website that they had to offer and free domain because it would take me away from the things that I really would like to focus on and that my audience is actually on my channel for. And so I would return with monetization, some type of monetary compensation for my time because I would have to learn what it is that they do. I would have to learn how I could put this in a video that would make sense. And again, my audience isn't really there for e-commerce. So that type of offer, I would definitely not be as willing to take because it just doesn't line up with brand. So paying attention to that is very important to me. Um, and then again, you know, at the end of the day, we're here to, to make a living. So uh, there's certain companies that, you know, if you go on platforms now, I'm very easily able to see if they're working with other brand deals or brand partners. And so I'll, I'll look at other channels to see, okay, are they working with other people? Cause that gives you a good indication of, you know, that they're willing to spend money to get their message out there. Uh, one company that I work with, I, I know there's at least five of us that are talking about the same thing. And we're kind of all talking about it at the same time. And so they are really pushing hard now. So they're taking their advertising dollars and giving it to the, the creators, the influencers to get the message out there. And so asking for the right compensation is, is huge. And that's something that I always go back for. And then I think about things that are like, in demand or needed at the time and being at home in 2020 here, microphones and, and web cameras, those home essentials, lightings, those things are in high demand and people are really looking for that. So those would also help me for my channel because my audience will like it. 
And then finally, I, I really like to ask for the exposure now. Um, out, of, out of everything I said before, the exposure is the most important to me at this point because if I can get more people to come to my YouTube channel, you know, if, or I can get you to put this in a, a, a blast, an email blast of hundreds of thousands of people, that would allow my personal brand and my business to grow over there to an audience of people that would probably have never have found me otherwise. So if I can get them to see my brand, to see my face, to see what it is that I'm able to teach and help them with, that's important to me now too. So not just having a free software or a free microphone anymore, it's definitely okay. If I can get more exposure, that also helps as well. And so these are things that us as creators just have to pay attention to um, really for the long term. You know, the short term wins are great, but you definitely want to consider the long term things that you have available to you as well. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting what you say there about, you know, leveraging uh, a brand's platform, existing platform, you know, to to promote yourself, right? Because they have an audience as well. And and it's an audience who's interested in the kinds of stuff that you're talking about, right? Because there's overlap in terms of the equipment and the products that you're reviewing. So there's really some cool opportunity to kind of have some synergy there, which is which is really cool to hear you hear you talk about. Um in, t in terms of your audience, Tell me more about what you what you know about your audience. How have you gone about um, understanding better understanding their needs, their wants to make sure that you're delivering the kind of content that they would appreciate from you and more? I pay a lot of attention to the comment section. And that's how I've really learned my audience more on that personal level. Um, you know, I definitely pay attention to analytics. Uh, one thing that I love about the YouTube platforms, it gives you analytics of where people are watching from. So I know locations, I understand uh, age demographics, click through rates, all that is great and something to definitely pay attention to. But as someone that does a lot of tutorial videos, it's, I have to understand, is my message clear enough? Is it concise? Is it uh, able to actually help them. And so when I pay attention to the comment section, it really lets me know who is watching because, you know, when you teach, if you're, anybody that's ever taught before, you know, you don't understand, uh, automatically the person's knowledge level, especially if they're a complete stranger, which is, you know, this online world. So I don't know if I'm talking too elevated or too low. So being able to pay attention to comments kind of keeps me in that sweet spot where I understand, okay, this information, this last video might have been too, too much information. Let me bring it down a little bit. Let me make it more concise. Let me break it down a little bit. And so the comments really allow me to understand, okay, my audience needs basic information to get them started or to help them take one next step up. They don't need very complicated statistics of how things work. They just need, actually need to see it. Which cable do I need to buy? And that's what I'm going to buy. Which camera do I need to buy? And that's the one I want to buy. They don't need a whole bunch of the the information's techie people like uh, that's just confusing to them. And so I make sure now when I do my videos that I keep it simple, you know, you will understand my video by the time you're done watching it. I, I watched one of your your videos too recently um, where you talked about content ideation. And it's interesting that you talk about the importance of comments to understand your audience. But I remember in that video, you talking about comments as being a really good source for for content ideas too. Exactly. Yeah. So if, if, if there's something that I might have left out on a video or something that wasn't clear, that allows me to create another video. I can go a little bit further onto that subject. You know, live streaming is the most popular thing in the world in uh, this year. And so when I read comments, you know, when I create the video, I know in my mind how I'm gonna create this video, what I'm gonna teach. But that comment section, if there's a question in there, I can expand upon that. I can create another video. I, I can teach more people and help more people. And especially if you see multiple comments about the same thing, that's just a good indication that, hey, we have questions here. Can you help us in creating that next video or that next post or you know, updating your community and getting that specific question answered definitely allows you to create more content and further understand your audience. I'm curious too about consistency as well. Like you mentioned this again, I don't know, it might've been the same video or probably another one, but you had mentioned this, 
this rule of 50. I had never heard of this before. And it's just like this idea of focusing on trying to just get your first 50 videos up when you're when you're getting started on YouTube. And, and that's something you did to kind of build the momentum that you were able to generate for yourself in 2020. Can you can you tell me more about just the process of staying consistent and and publishing content on the regular for YouTube? Yeah, the the way these social media platforms work, you you have to be consistent in your posting. You have to get people to actually watch your videos to respond. And so when it comes to YouTube, I, I have this rule of 50 videos because you you get so stuck looking at the numbers. Am I getting subscribers? How many subscribers subscribe today? How many subscribers are subscribed for the week? And you get caught in these ruts early on and you don't want to do that. You, you really want to focus on just getting the content up there to let the platforms know that, hey, I'm serious. I am here. I want to, I want to put content on your platform. I want you to automatically help me get this content seen by other people. Because a lot of questions that I get about how do you grow your YouTube channel and I'll go to their channel I'm like you had nothing there. You, you have three videos. Nope. You have to put up more and more content and keep just putting up the content because it helps you learn your audience. You know, YouTube is going to help put the videos in front of what they think is going to be your audience. And then your audience will actually be able to find you. It's a lot easier to find someone if they have a larger digital footprint. The, the more information you have out here on these social platforms, it's just a lot easier for people to come across your video on YouTube, on Google, you know, just doing a search and you pop up. One of my videos, it ranks number one in a Google search. You know, I wasn't trying to do that, but it wouldn't happen unless I had other content that was already on the platform. So you definitely want to make sure that you're just getting getting the content up there and and not so much just focusing on that one video you know you need to just i tell people just repurpose content you know long form video break it down into smaller segments and you know the more that you have up there the lot easier for it is for people to find you and when they find you if you have videos it's just so much more credibility um, i look at the comment sections and sometimes i'll see people leave a comment on three and four videos like back to back to back so i'm like oh that's awesome because now they're watching more of my content, it must resonate with them versus just having one or two videos up there. And you don't want someone just to come to watch one video and then they leave and they go off to somewhere else. So definitely putting 50 videos up on YouTube is my standard of, you know, this is a starting point. And then updating, especially weekly, you know, you definitely don't want to try to miss weeks. Uh, you want to be consistent. And early on in my YouTube journey, I was putting up about three videos a week. I was just putting them up, putting them up, putting them up. So now I'm about a one a week, but you definitely want to be consistent. So what's your process like now, um, you know, in terms of, of producing and filming all your videos at this point, you know, you've got the new home office that you're, you're building up right now, which is cool. Um, but like kind of walk me through what, what it looks like from idea to production to then post-production of, of a video for you. Yeah, so I, I kind of start with um, trending topics. I really like to see what's trending in the marketplace um, or things that I might have that I haven't done a tech review on. So those are kind of my starting points because ultimately you, we want people to come across our content. And so if you can tap into trends, uh, things that are happening in real time, that's the best place to start when it comes to that creation for me. And so I'll just jot down some notes, some of the highlights that I want to talk about, usually about three to five bullet points that I really want to talk about in that specific video. Uh, for me personally, I don't do a lot of scripting where I have the whole format written out and then I go back and read it. It just doesn't flow well for me as my personality type and people seem to uh, actually like the fact that I kind of come off the cuff sometimes and kind of teach in real time. And so I will look at the camera and I will just, you know, I'm an introvert, so it's always hard to turn on the camera, but I understand there's so much value in just turning on the camera. And I will just go through and just start talking about those, those points that I have uh, for that specific video. And so usually I can knock that video out within about 30 to 45 minutes. And then I upload it on the computer, upload it into my Dropbox, send it over to the video editor. And then I don't think about it again until they're done editing the video. And what's great about it is, you know, the videos get edited while I'm asleep. So that creation process, you know, keeps going, you know, even while I'm asleep, you know, the ball keeps rolling. 
And then once I get that video back, you know, I just proof it and then upload it onto YouTube. And so I try to do two to three videos a week where I can just sit and record. And if I can't get those two to three videos in a week because maybe more sponsors wanna reach out and I have obligations with them, um, then I'll make sure that I'll take content that I've done before, maybe from a Zoom meeting or a one-on-one -on -one consultation. If you know, they're, they're willing to allow me to use parts of that video and I can use parts of that video as my content and so i have a couple different ways that i make sure that i have something there but for youtube specifically i definitely jot down my notes what i want this video to be about key points that i want to highlight and then make sure i get it edited and uploaded um, pretty much that same week really i don't really try to take a long time between the recording process and uploading process i definitely want to get it up again because i'm trying to tap into trends and so you definitely don't want to be the last person on the trend otherwise your video doesn't get seen as well but that's kind of my process of how i go about creating a youtube video how long do you usually take for yourself to to ideate um some of these topics like are you sitting down maybe for like 30 minutes or an hour going through google trends and then and then bulleting everything out before you start filming? Yeah, I, I probably take longer than I should um, just because I go down the rabbit holes. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at other YouTube videos that might have been done on it. Uh, I'm looking at Google Trends and to see what's going on out there. And, and typically Sundays are my relaxed day. And so that's the time where I'll kind of just scour the internet, kind of write out my goals for the week, my ideas for the week, because I, I really like to record on Mondays now. I found that's kind of my sweet spot for recording. And so if I can sit down on a Sunday afternoon and, you know, I'm not stressing about it. I'm just kind of watching the game maybe, but just kind of, I jot my ideas as they're coming to me. Um, I don't like to force it, you know, because, you know, it just, when I get to the editing part or when I get to the recording process, you know, it, it's a sticking point for me and I don't like to get stuck on video and that's why a lot of people just don't do it. So if it can just kind of flow naturally, my thoughts just flow naturally when I actually get in front of the camera, I've kind of gone through it in my head, you know, for at least 30 minutes. You know, I like to go get in the shower and just kind of, you know, open my mind up and it kind of allows me to process the video, you know, what I want to say. I actually practice saying it in the shower and then I come, you know, and then I just go ahead and just knock it out. Are there still ever points where you where you get stuck? You know, I, I've talked to other creators, too, who, you know, who, who feel sometimes a little bit of that resistance i don't know i've brought this up in other podcasts i'll bring it up again but like the idea of of the resistance from this book called the war of art by stephen pressfield and it's like everything that you it, it, it's it's this feeling that will just stop you from from doing the actual work like anything that can kind of come in the way it, it will it will it will try to rear its ugly head so like are you ever feeling that these days and, and if you do what what are things that you you try to do to kind of overcome that. Yeah, um, definitely feel that. Um, if I'm an introvert, I don't like the camera, so I already have those factors working against me, right? So when I get to the camera, sometimes I'll literally, if if I don't feel good, like that is my excuse uh, for not doing a video. I have, a, I have a friend, he says, no, those are reasons. You, you, we don't have all these excuses. We have all these reasons because we don't want to say we have excuses, right? We have reasons for not doing something. And so if I don't feel good, I'll, I'll stop. If I'm I was a little bit hungry, then I'm like, you know what? Let me go eat first and then I'll come back and record this video. Or, you know what? Let me go clean up and straighten up a little bit because it's messy when I could do all that stuff after the fact. And so all these little reasons do creep up and you know and then sometimes you just have like a mental block where you might be recording and it's just not coming out right you know i'm not the most eloquent of speech and so sometimes like i just cannot get the words just to come out the way i want to and when you get frustrated you know that's just the easy reason to turn off the camera and go do something else and so I, you know the ways i try to combat that is just knowing that i have a schedule I, you know, I have to get this done and I, and I keep the end in mind, you know, you know, I do have an audience of people that are looking for me. Uh, I, I missed one, one week, one time and people were like, are you okay? What's going on? And so, you know, it's not just about me anymore. It's my audience. They're actually looking forward to that next video. So keeping the end in mind and, and sometimes you go look in the, the, uh, the monetization stat column and you're like, oh, if I don't put up a video, 
that monetization number is going to go down this week. So I need to put up a video. So that also encourages you to, to do more videos and, you know, just, you know, having that personal time and, and you know, doing things that just relax you kind of gets you back in the mood. But, you know, a lot of times the yeah, things creep up and give you reasons to not want to do it, or you just feel this piece of content or this video, is it just going to do well? And so, you know, a lot of times we just, you know, we do it to ourselves and there are different ways that I use to, to kind of combat that and, you know, looking at the stats and knowing my audience is there and that they're waiting for that next video. So time to, to suck it up and hit record and, and keep going. When did you start implementing a schedule for yourself? Was this something that you started doing a little bit further into the process? Well, I've always had a calendar. I've always had a personal calendar. I just like to look at, and see what's going on for the week. Uh, but for YouTube specifically, um, you know, I definitely have to put it on the calendar. I will do this at this time. And because otherwise, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to freelance it where something comes up, another reason, and you just don't do it. But I've always lived off a calendar and just really had a good outline of what my days always look like, what my weeks look like in my years. So I can kind of uh, plan for upcoming events and hopefully uh, through the power of YouTube that, you know, and the world opens back up, I can get some more speaking opportunities with these sponsors. And, you know, you definitely want to know what your calendar looks like ahead of time. So I've always used it for personal, uh, but definitely uh, just to kind of stay focused is really that reason that I like to use a calendar. Yeah. And I imagine too, it helps you with just the balance, right? Because like not, not only do you have to focus on, you know, figuring out when you have to do this work, when you have to get in front of the camera, create content for YouTube. But at the same time, with having a calendar, you're able to see, okay, this is when I have to work, but then these blocks of hours in my day, I can have free time here. And it, I imagine too, it's just like so difficult at times to just have balance in your life, especially in a year like 2020, where most people for the first time are going remote and those the world, the, the, the lines between their world at work and their worlds at home are like so blended together. How, how do you, how do you kind of keep yourself sane, you know, from, from, uh, from just having to work at home and, and also, you know, work, work re remotely as well? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm privileged that, you know, I get to be in the house, you know, and I don't necessarily have to think about going at, you know, out and driving up the road and commuting and all that other stuff. You know, I don't have any kids running around the house and everything like that. So, you know, that allows, you know, more time where I can kind of focus, but I do try to time block as much, much as I can. You know, if I have a two hour window, I can just time block and focus. Um, I'm not much of a multitasker, you know, it's been told to me before you're not a multitasker. So I understand that I'm good at focusing on a project and getting that done. Let's complete this. And then I move on to the next one. Um, and so if I can time block and, and focus, it really helps me that way when I do deep compress or, you know, go watch TV. I'm focused on TV. I'm not really focused on what it is that I have to do for that next YouTube video, um, getting fresh air, taking a walk, you know, those times to just think. So I'm really good about, you know, just focusing on the moment and not just being consumed with so many different things in my head, because, you know, when it comes down to, you know, creating content, the last thing you want to be thinking about is, you know, what's going on down the street? You know, what is the siren that I'm hearing? You know, you want to be locked in and focused. And so I've been pretty good about doing that. I think that's probably more of a personality thing, but, you know, um, I've been doing it for so long now, it seems like at this point, I guess, you know, teaching online four years, a long time, <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, I, I've kind of learned some of these different little tactics that definitely helped me um, stay focused. Have you ever read or heard of the book Deep Work by Cal Newport? No, but I will after this uh, podcast. Yeah, you should check it out, man. Like that's that's very reminiscent what you're talking about in like terms of time blocking and whatnot is, I mean, his whole premise is this idea of setting aside time where you, you know, turn off the cell phone, minimize distractions, and then just allow yourself to to really focus on really like thought intensive intensive work, right? Like so creative work, creating YouTube videos and whatnot is something that requires deep work. And there's like this idea that you don't necessarily need, you know, 10 hours of deep work. In fact, that's probably like way too much, but three to four hours of time a day 
is is enough to get you by yeah because i definitely set the the phone aside you know it's over to the side right now you know it's not going to be a distraction to me and you know, where i gotta lift it up and you know my other laptop is off and you know you know so definitely yeah i'm gonna check that book out because that's something that i already do but you know it helps you know especially with you know if you have that 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 syndrome, I forget what it's called off the top of my head, where everything shiny object syndrome, you know, you see, yeah, you see that, and you see that, and then you're all over the place, and then you look back over your day, and you're like, I didn't get anything accomplished, and you know, that's one thing that as a creator, you know, you, you don't want to create these defeats at the end of the day because when you go to that next day, you're just like, oh my gosh, I have to do so much more, and you know, you're. You're, you're pressing and I like to definitely just let it freely come out and just um, not have to, you know, do things to myself that's self-sabotaging, you know, if I can prevent that, that just definitely makes the creative process so much easier. Yeah, it's it's kind of like this idea of just trying to be 1% better each day because then if you're 1% better every day for the whole year, well, then you'll have increased by 365%. So that's a three X like improvement on, on everything that you're, you're doing. And if you kind of apply that to, to YouTube where, you know, the, uh, the audience views and whatnot, that can, that growth can kind of compound over time. You know, it's just about being a little bit better every day and just kind of doing the bare minimum, I guess, to, to try and stay on track. Yeah, you, you definitely don't have to be perfect. And that's what I tell people, you know, people that I've been working with, helping them grow their YouTube channels and, you know, Amazon live channels now too, is you just have to start. You don't have to be perfect. You're going to learn, you know, just like, you know, I was talking about the mistakes that happen, the tech issues that happen. You're going to learn this as you go. But if you never get started, um, you'll, you'll never grow. And so just starting, you know, one day at a time, okay, now I learned this, the next day I'm gonna try something a little bit extra. Next day I'm gonna try a little bit extra. But, you know, getting stuck and just not doing it is a way that you will never, you know, increase that 1% every single day. You just have to keep going every single day and just, you know, don't don't try to just go, I have to be just like this person. You know, they're so far ahead, I have, I have to do every single thing they're doing. You don't have to do that. You'll, you'll get there just one day at a time, 1% at a time. Tell me a little bit more about Amazon Live. Like this is actually a platform that I've just discovered myself. I, I literally just saw this like the other day while I was doing some research and I was shocked. I'm like, wow, what is this? I have I had no idea about this. Obviously, Amazon has the history of, of owning um, Twitch, which is, you know, big live streaming platform, mostly for video gamers and whatnot. But tell me about like, some best practices, um, what you're learning so far about utilizing that as a platform for yourself? Well, I'll just say it's a very untapped platform right now. Um, I, f I first came across Amazon Live in June 2020. And so I did a, a practice stream. They have this practice mode where you can do a live stream on their platform. And so I was like, this is pretty interesting. So just kind of reading up some verbiage on it, but I didn't really dive deep into it at that time. But um, a couple months ago, I was like, well, I want to really get into this Amazon Live thing and see what's going on here. And so if you go to Amazon.com, they have a live streams tab. You click on that and you can see a list of creators that are going live on the platform. And it's really a way to uh, earn affiliate commissions and work with some of these brand deals, apparently, because some of the people I'm working with, they've already got offers from brand deals. So I'm still waiting on my first Amazon Live brand deal. Uh, but you know, you go live, you talk about products that you own. Maybe it's something that you just like. And if you, it's almost like a QVC HSN style for those people that are familiar with it, except you are the host. So you can talk about the, the products you own, the things that you like, the uh, games, the, the tech, you know, the books that you have that you want to promote and they have different subcategories and so you can actually uh, get on there and create your own time schedule you can grow a following on there as well and because the platform is so new at this time a lot of people like yourself you know they're they're just hearing about it um, but you know it's been around for the whole year 2020 and because there's not a lot of creators on the platform right now it gives you a lot of room to grow faster because once people do jump over there, there's not a lot of creators there. Because if you ever go and you look at the uh, the list of replays, you, you can actually get in 
each list of those replays and see your videos there for like a week and it's just saved there and every time somebody clicks on amazon they have their affiliate commissions and they they check out then you're going to earn that extra commission and so growing a following on there um, i'm working on my a-list status right now which is the highest status that's the last one i have to left to achieve and they actually do webinars now to talk about the platform and so it's it's slowly rolling out to the masses where they're hearing about it but those people that are creators, I would definitely say hop on it because there aren't a lot of creators on the platform yet. And I can only imagine if I started on YouTube when YouTube first came out and I'm like, okay, well, here's my opportunity. This is Amazon Live and, you know, pretty decent sized company, Amazon. So, you know, I figure out, let me jump into this a little bit uh, sooner than later. So are, are there any things that you're doing that are similar to what you do on YouTube on, on Amazon Live? Or are, are, are you kind of approaching it a little bit differently since it is, it's a live streaming platform, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a couple things that are similar, um, some things that are different. The difference is really is that YouTube is more of that edited video content. So you, you've got some music in your content, you've got some B-roll action going on, and, it, and it's an edited final version of your video. You can still go live on YouTube, but you know most content that we come across on YouTube, for the most part, is that edited final video, um, where Amazon Live is live. They don't want you to have pre-recorded video. They want you to be live. They want you to engage with your audience in real time. Um, some of the similarities are that when it comes to graphic design, the graphics are the same size for your thumbnails on both platforms. So that makes it easy. So you can use the same graphics for both platforms. Um, I love the fact that Amazon Live is, is real time because I do like engaging with an audience. So that definitely helps. Um, some, of the, some of the things to keep in mind with Amazon Live is though that you can schedule your videos in advance. So to promote your videos. So it's similar to YouTube Premiere where, you know, you can let people know, hey, this is where I'm going to be at a certain time. Amazon has that same thing where you can create that uh, link ahead of time and send that out and promote it. So there are some similarities and differences when it comes to it. Um, the language is a little bit different on YouTube. It's, hey, subscribe to my channel. On Amazon, it's click the follow button. So things like that, you know, you try to keep the verbiage uh, different. And, and when you're doing all these platforms, sometimes you might stumble over it, but you'll learn it. One, again, one of those things, how do you learn this stuff? You, you practice, you, you just jump in and you start doing it. Uh, so it, the platforms are definitely uh, wide open, I think, even YouTube. I, I do think YouTube is a wide open platform for people to still tap into, even though it's been around for a while. And Amazon is that new hot platform and they continue to grow. They continue to be this behemoth company where now they're allowing creators to come and if you get a deal with Amazon or a partnership with Amazon or they see you really on the platform, you know, they they will probably reach out because I had one webinar that I attended and the gentleman that was running it, he worked for Amazon. He said, we're a really small team. We're still learning this stuff. They were having some technical issues with their live stream. And he literally made the comment that some of our creators know more about the platform than we do because they're using it on their end. See, so we're behind the scenes. We're on the opposite side of it. So reach out to the creators on the platform. And, you know, it's definitely an opportunity for people to jump into. Yeah, that's that's super interesting, man, because when you think about all the platforms that are out there, especially, you know, like social media versus search versus Amazon search. I mean, Amazon, people are going to Amazon already thinking, I need to buy something, Buy right? Versus mm -hmm. like somebody on social media, they, they might be just scrolling passively through their through their feeds. With search on, on YouTube and Google, depending on the keywords that you target, you know, you could you could capture that intent, but definitely with Amazon, there's like a lot of yeah, they, they are ready to hit the buy. I, I've literally done about a dozen live streams and I've generated through the Amazon platform like almost 10,000 in sales generated. Now, I wish I had all of that in commission payout, but to think that doing a, a dozen or so live streams and over $10,000 worth of product has been purchased by people all around the world. That, that's that's a, a, a move that a lot of these companies want. So they want to tap into if we can sell products right now, you know, on this platform, hey, 
they're going to reach out to content creators. I just saw Oprah uh, had a stream on Amazon Live, and if Oprah's doing it, something's got to be right about it. Yeah. <laughs> if, if Oprah's on the platform, then you probably want to follow too. That's, this is going to be really interesting to follow in like the com coming years with, with Amazon, them getting involved with like the live streaming stuff from, from their own brand standpoint. Um, by the way, Monty, I want to be like respectful of your time. Are you are you still good to go for a little bit longer? Or do you need to wrap? up? I'm good to go. Okay, cool. I'm good, good. to go. Um, I want to ask you also about outsourcing the work that you know you you can do, but you're not necessarily the best at, right? Like video editing is 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 the one thing I believe that you're doing right now in terms of of outsourcing. Um, and I know the story from like talking to you before about, you know, why you decided to outsource video editing, but can you share what, what was the, the breaking point for you in your YouTube career where you said, okay, I got to like get this off to somebody else who can handle this so that I can focus more on just creating content, coming up with ideas and, and doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like we talked about a little earlier, you know, was, I had these ideas in my head that I wanted to put out. But in order to do that, one, I wasn't as skilled as I wanted to be in it. I could do it uh, from a basic standpoint, you know, better than a lot of people when it comes to the video editing. But, you know, the story I wanted to tell with video, I wasn't able to do. And so that would be that part that would that sticking point again, you know, because I I recorded the video, went through all this process and time to put together a video and record it. Now I'm stuck on the editing part of it where I've got to edit this video. And so the time factor really would slow my creative process down and it would allow, or it would cause me not to be consistent in getting videos uploaded. And so I was like, one of the very first things when I got my channel monetized um, is find an, a company that I can outsource video editing to. Um, I love to do it. You know, I still do it locally for my church and, and, you know, some small projects because I know how to do it. But, you know, for for my brand, in order to grow, in order to get more content out there, I needed to find a company to do it. And so I started going around, came across this company, Video Husky, talked to them. And I've been working with one editor all year long. Like he pumps my videos back overnight within a day, sometimes two, depending on if I have a like a larger edit. And it's like one less thing I have to even think about. So I can now focus more so on the, the content and getting that up there. So, you know, when, when you able to monetize through affiliates and brand deals and things like that, you definitely want to look for those things that take a lot of your resources and video editing for me was the one thing that I knew I had to unload to get up. I could, I could, I could record my own videos, you know, but I just, the editing part took so long. So when I, when I started doing outsourcing with video Husky and, and having videos edited, I could get more done. I could spend more time creating videos. I could have more time to respond to emails and work on course material. And it just freed up so much. So video editing for me is the thing that I absolutely had to outsource. It, it's definitely helped me grow because that time I can start to use it for something else. When when looking for a video editor, what are some some best practices or some recommendations that you have? Whether they want to come to a company like Video Husky or maybe they want to just work with a freelancer too, you know, there's opportunities to do that on Upwork or on Fiverr or I mean you could post on Craigslist <laughs> if you want to and try to find freelancers. I mean, what 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 were some things that you were looking for when when you decided okay this is something that I'm gonna I'm gonna outsource to somebody else? Yeah, for for me, I knew I needed something that was more on a permanent basis versus just one off projects. Um, again, one off projects are something that I could I could handle or easily find someone to do a one off project. But I knew that I was in in the long game of video, so I needed something that was more stable than just a, a freelancer. Um, and somebody that could really just dedicate time to me. Um, looking at price is always something to consider. So, um, you know, I didn't outsource video editing until it paid for itself through YouTube. So once YouTube was paying me uh, enough to pay a full-time or, you know, someone that could just full-time work on my videos, 
that's what I was looking for. Um, those, those are the major things. And then the style of video, you know, being able to make sure that you can kind of test something out and see if that editor aligns with what you're thinking, because, you know, I've heard some horror stories where, you know, people have sent stuff to an edit and it's not even close to what they want. So then you have to go find another editor or another editor and being able to just have, okay, this is what I want. And, you know, I feel comfortable with this person putting together that story for me is something that I was really looking for. So that, that those are the things that I look for. You know, again, you, there's a lot of great video editors out there, but you know, to have someone that can just focus on you, they get to learn your style too. And, and, and frankly, they're probably going to be better than what you're capable of doing. Cause thank God for mine. Cause I don't know a lick about color grading and like, that's one thing like I wouldn't even touch, but you know, for them to work on a 4k video, oh my God, how do I leave that out? You know, most people will, will, kind of shun you a little bit there for 4k video because the files are so massive and they need to upload them and download them and so I, I had to have someone that could just work on 4k video for me and and just you know as they learn you they they understand what you're looking for so there's a lot of things now that I don't have to type in my messages say hey can you do this this and that and when I, I love getting videos back where I'm just like whoa I didn't even think of that. That's awesome. So, you know, all those little things that, you know, you, once you find that editor, you definitely know if it's going to be a good fit for you within those first couple edits. And then, you know, if it's something that is not a good fit, you definitely look for, you know, someone that can align with your brand and your messaging. Uh, but yeah, reaching out to people, looking at reviews online, you know, is, does this company look reputable or does this person look reputable? Can I see some of your previous work? You know, those are all things that allow you to see what's possible and, and, and if it's something that you want to align yourself with and someone you want to work with. There was something that you said there that was super interesting to me. And it was the idea that you, you know, you, you said, I'm not going to pay for video editing until like, it's, it can pay for itself. Like you, you reinvested the profits that you, or the revenue that you were getting out of YouTube into this, you know, other facet now of your, your YouTube, um, your, your YouTube beast, I guess that you're creating as a, for lack of better terms there. Like, I mean, I think that's something that, you know, in any endeavor, people kind of get lost on right like especially with equipment and like oh i gotta have the best camera i gotta have like the best lights i have to have the best microphone i have to have and i if i i can't start until i have that when in reality it's like it's almost like you should you should kind of approach it like playing a video game where you're starting at like level one and then maybe you you stair step your way up to level two you upgrade your equipment you stair step to level three now you hire a video editor does that kind of sound like an accurate way of of how people maybe should try and approach um tackling youtube and video content in general absolutely like so going back to that rule of 50 you know I don't early on in, in your video journeys, I, I tell people don't get so stuck on like, I need 15,000 people to watch this video. Well, the reality is 15,000 people are probably not going to watch that video. So don't even think that if, if five people watch the video, be happy because all we're focused in on is doing your first 50 videos. So once you get past those first 50 videos that are not perfect, you know, you've done enough to edit them and get them done then you can see if this is going to work for you. Because the last thing you want to do is, you know, pay all this money on a whole bunch of cameras and equipment and editing and all these services that you think you need when your video content might not even be what people are looking for. Maybe you haven't even defined who your audience is. You're just talking, talking, you know, five different industries. You're talking to cars and cooking and gaming and you can't even grow an audience yet. So you spend all this money and there's nothing happening as a result of it. And so those first 50 videos allow you to see what's working. And then once things start to work, then you can take that next level. Okay, well, I'm doing a cooking channel and I want to people, people to better see the food. So I'll go get a camera so that they can better see because in the comments section that we talked about, they said, Hey, can you improve the quality of the video or the video looks a little grainy? Okay. Now I know I have an audience. And now I can, I can talk to my audience. Okay. I'll get the camera and now we do the next one. Well, 
can you do two cooking shows a week or can you upload two videos a week? We really like the content. Okay, well, that audience is growing and they let you know, okay, well, maybe I can't edit two videos a week. Maybe it's time for me to look at a video editor so that I can spend more time editing or recording videos to get those up for my audience. So taking that stair step approach is something that you definitely should do. Start where you are, use what you have um, before going out and buy stuff. You, you definitely want a business to pay for itself. And you, you don't want to just spend all this money and you know hope something's going to happen. You, you definitely want to make sure that the business is able to pay for itself. Yeah, you can bootstrap things a lot these days. I mean, I was even mentioning to you, like, for anybody watching this podcast out here, I will be totally honest with you. The camera that I am using right now is my iPhone 8. <laughs> and so I'm not using I'm not using a mirrorless camera or a DSLR camera or anything like that. Would love to upgrade at some point. But I think it's cool to kind of, you know, use what's available to you right now as, and and kind of set that as a constraint for yourself and see what you can kind of come up with before before you actually upgrade equipment now uh, granted i do have a, a nice recorder here for for the audio obviously because it's it's a podcast we want to make sure that the audio is is great but that's something that i was willing to that's one small thing that i was willing to invest in but other things i'm just trying to trying to bootstrap as much as possible and i think a lot of people can benefit from that mentality. Audiences like to see growth too. So if you come out perfect, you know, you have no room to improve. They, they love seeing the new stuff, you know, you know, every time I do a behind the scenes shot, oh my goodness, like, I think those are always the best videos. Hey, I got a new monitor. And so people are like, I wanna see, I wanna see, I wanna see. But if I started off with the big monitor and all the fancy equipment, that growth never happens. And, and people like to see you grow and evolve over time. Yeah, that's that's something I've I've enjoyed, too, as I've you know, we've started this podcast and, and doing research on creators like yourself. I like to go into the YouTube channels of people that I interview and then I will sort the videos out from from oldest to newest. So show me like the oldest videos. And it's so cool to see where people started their journeys you know i had i had another guy on um his guy he he uh he basically creates um content around airbnb um tiny homes alternative living and whatnot he built an airbnb in his house his channel is called rob built and this dude was starting he started with just an iphone and you can see the progress from like from when he first started to where he is today it, it's incredible and it's it it especially if you're you 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 start with the audience early and i imagine you have people like this too um who who found you as you were starting to make your rise and now they're seeing oh monty's on the come up this is cool like i was there at the beginning like i don't know for me as as like a as somebody who watches youtube videos there's there's a sense of pride when you see you know a creator who wasn't that big but was on the rise start to really take off and and just be able to say oh cool i was there at the beginning of of their youtube career yeah i, I you know i have people that follow me when i first got online you know I, I actually started my live streaming journey on periscope and then migrated over to facebook and started with my one webcam and was teaching people how do you do live stream and then i added two webcams and then i added a, a camera and then i had one uh, monitor, then I went to three monitors. So I have people that go with me all the way back there and then they've seen everything happen up till now. And yeah, they definitely, you know, that's part of the reason they've stayed with me is because they see that, you know, the person that is, is teaching them, you know, I just happen to be in the tech space, but that's teaching them this tech thing they actually see the growth and they're able to follow along and that encourages people too you know as they, as channels grow you know you want your audience to grow as well what is it like engaging with those people um in your community right like you i, I get the sense that you're you're building a community of people who you know it's not just i think the old way of doing things before was very much like hey I'm here on the screen or I have the microphone, you listen to me and there's no dialogue, but clearly with like the internet, you know, there's more of a dialogue there. There's engagement between you as the proprietor of the channel and the people that are watching you as well. Cause as you mentioned, you're, you know, looking to them for ideas for in, in the comment section and whatnot. So, I mean, 
tell me a little bit more about what what that's like for you to kind of manage that that community that you're building yeah it, it's interesting because you know i like to like teach and 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 want repurpose content for the business goal but sometimes you really have to really just what does my audience want and what do they need so for example you know in in the zoom platform you can do webinar style when it's just a one-way communication you don't even see someone um, you don't see their faces but and I, and I tried that like one time and, and it just did not work my audience very quickly wanted to interact and see me and i felt the same way because I wanted to see what questions do you have? I want to see your face on the screen. I want to hear your voice. Let's interact. And that way I can better help you. I can better serve you. You know, sometimes when we type things in the chat box, you know, the communication is lost. The verbiage isn't there. And, you know, if people have questions, they don't know what verbiage to use. So you're going to have this, this issue where you just don't understand each other. And so being able to just interact with them, you know, on YouTube where they find me and then they, you know, join me in a community group on Facebook or something like that or in a Zoom conference. Now I get to see a face and a name together and a voice and understand what that person's needs are. And, you know, I, I literally remember like ch telling my uh, YouTube community, I said, well, I'm going to switch over Zoom to a different format so I can repurpose my content for YouTube. I'm, I'm telling them exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, and they understood why I was going to do it that way. I just need a nice, clean recording for YouTube. Right. So my YouTube audience can get some value as well. But they said, no, this is not working. And I said, no, this is not working. We, we have to interact. So if this recording uh, has everybody's faces on the screen, they were fine with it. You know, if this recording allowed them to talk to me and I talk back to them, they were fine with it. And so for the business case, I wanted to do a different way, but for the audience, I had to do it a different way. And I don't mind doing that because ultimately that's who I'm here to serve is my audience. One of the last few things I want to talk to you about as we start to wrap up here on, on the show is I alluded to it earlier was, you know, you, you now have online courses, you're, you're, you're selling online courses. You've, you've built those out. Can you tell me about you know, what that was like to put those together. Cause I imagine it's, it, it would probably be like writing an ebook or something like that. Right. Cause there's, it, it's not something that you can whip up overnight to, to put together, to put together a course. Yeah. I got, I got a shout out designhacker.com. Those are my guys over there. Um, because they helped me actually focus on putting a course together. Um, uh, before YouTube, you know, I would go live on other platforms and, and have a subject in mind and teach on that subject, but it wasn't structured. So if you missed, you know, the previous day's live stream, you were behind, or maybe it didn't make sense. And so I had to structure, begin to structure the content. So if someone wanted to learn a particular subject, you know, it was an easy place for them to go watch the videos in order. So initially, before I even got into the courses, that's why I jumped into YouTube was because I knew I could create a playlist so you could watch the videos um, consecutively behind each other. But I knew the monetization piece. I had to also create courses as well, things that dove deeper into it, uh, places that had communities where people could ask questions amongst themselves. So creating the courses I th was easier than I expected because it's something that I already do. I already teach it all the time. So being able to just edit the videos was going to be the longest part of my course creation process. So once I started just recording the content and making that available, then people actually went and they would buy the courses. So it's amazing that, you know, I started on YouTube and people buy courses coming off of YouTube and they have never interacted with me. And the only other way that people would have even noticed that I was there was to find me on Facebook. But you know, there's no search on Facebook. You know, you just can't stumble across certain people. You know, all the celebrities get all that search traffic on Facebook. So if you're a smaller creator, you know, being on the right platform again kind of helps you actually do better um, in your business. And so being able to put these courses together again, not having to worry about the editing part of the videos definitely makes it easier to create that other additional stream of income through courses and the consultation stuff that's all on the website now. Tell me about the pricing for your courses. How like that's that's I mean, it's similar to what we were talking about earlier in terms of like negotiating with brands what you want. Um, 
how are you how are you going about deciding how to price what your what your course is valued at so i do anywhere from free to about a thousand dollars for my courses right so the free is to really give people so much value that they're like okay i'm going to get another course eventually so i just want people to know who i am the value i can provide to them and give them just so much information that free is a no-brainer to them so once I do that, then I also look at other creators in the marketplace. What are they pricing their courses at? What are they including in their courses? How much time are they giving uh, the course attendees? You know, in, in my actual YouTube training, I'm actually there. It started as a six week course. Um, I'm a little bit different. I was like, hey, you guys want to go to rest of 2020 and we just show you how to do this stuff in a group setting. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. And I actually have people that never I've gone through the course, but they're really only there for the live sessions where we can do the dialogue. And so, you know, it's, it's amazing that, you know, you, you set up one thing and thinking, okay, this is the priority when really they just wanted access to me, just to talk to me, just to kind of pick my brain. And so being able to have courses from zero to a thousand dollars, definitely I play with the the pricing model just to kind of see where things fit and then time I, I go back to time all the time I said that twice <laughs> just because that the value is in the time that it takes me to dedicate to a certain platform or to a certain course or to a certain group and so that's what I think about in pricing a lot is how can I value my time and then also you know as best we can make it affordable for that person that wants access and so i definitely do go from zero all the way up to a thousand and and now i'm telling people you know if you want free youtube find me on youtube and i will definitely try to get a video up about that particular subject if i can yeah it's like different levels of access right like if you you'll teach things you'll probably teach a lot of similar things in your courses that are on on youtube but you're going probably deeper in in the courses right you can give people like enough of the information on YouTube, um, but then in the courses you can dive in and provide a little bit more more information that you can just because there's there's more space space to do that. And just depending on the person, maybe the person might want to go and make that commitment and and jump into the course, um, or maybe they're just fine like going through through YouTube because. Like you mentioned, yeah, a lot of us. A lot of us are right. <laughs> yeah, a lot of us are just. A lot of us are totally fine with just going on Google or YouTube and and finding the information. But I, I think, like when I think about courses that I like, I I think about them in terms of just being like a curated selection of of information. Like I'm not having it saves me the time. Like that's the value in a course to me is it saves me the time to have to go out and search for all these bits and pieces. A, 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 that that I want to learn about and just go have one specific platform that has everything that I need to know and I just need to you know follow it step by step yeah and I say it all the time it's like I've probably taught it free somewhere but the course is uh structure is that that's essentially what someone's paying for is the structure of all that information that they're looking for yeah so Monty the last thing I want to ask you about as we as we conclude the the show here is just it's just, again, going back to the audience. You know, I know one of your latest videos that you posted, you, one of your subscribers is a woman named Susan, right? She wanted to learn about streaming and she stumbled on, you know, your videos. That was, the live streaming videos have really taken off. Those are the videos that really got your, your channel at the forefront on YouTube. Um, but she makes quilts <laughs> and your wife, Kay, um, saw this and decided, you know, hey, let's get a quilt as well. Um, and I, I'm just taking a quote here from like what you what you said in that video, like growing a YouTube channel in 2020 has allowed us to connect with some amazing people. Can you touch on just how much your your life has changed <laughs> since since really dedicating the time to to uh, to building up a presence on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, as business owners and creators, you, you get to these points and you're like, man, is, is this thing really going to take off? Or, you know, am I doing the right thing? Is what do I need to change? And you, you, you want to hit momentum at some point. 
And, and when you see these, you know, small wins, what we call them in our community, small win after small win after small win, then momentum really starts to um, take off for you. And, you know, someone like Susan that just found me on YouTube, you know, answering a problem for her. And, and that's really what I try to do on the channel is answer, provide answers to problems, provide these solutions to what someone is going to be looking for and and Susan she had came across my channel because you know she's in the quilting business and during the early part of 2020 you know things got shut down and she couldn't do the outdoor quilting sales that she was accustomed to doing every year and came across the channel and she she got value from that 20 minute video and she reached out to me and as a result of that video she paid my consultation fee she didn't know me from anybody else the only way she knew me was through my YouTube video. And it goes back to, I try to give as much value as I possibly can, you know, and she, she saw that value. And so she paid the, the session and we talked and I walked her through how to do a live stream so she could live stream her quilt show so they could still generate revenue that year. And her very first Facebook live, she came back when we had our follow up meeting and she's real just, you know, casual with it because I don't think she even knew how big of an impact that video was. And she's like, yeah, I got about 17,000 views on it about five days now. And I said, it, it, it blew me away. I was like, hold on. This was your very first Facebook live on a, on a platform called OBS where she could, you know, share the camera and share the quilt at the same time. Your very first live stream and you had 17,000 views. I said, Susan, that's not normal. <laughs> and so for someone like that to have a success story based off this information that I'm sharing with the world was just, it, it, it makes you as a creator know that, okay, what I'm doing is right. What I'm doing is good. What I'm doing is helping people. And then one video with 200,000 views, you know, for these churches that had no way to communicate with their audience. They were trying to, what do we do? You know, how do we get our message to our audience and have them connect and just to see so many comments on there. I think that video has over a thousand comments. Thank you for the video. Thank you for helping. This information allowed us to live stream and, you know, people just saying, thank you. That's a big deal. Um, for me just to know that the information is actually helping people and you know to be able to learn these people and meet some of these people you know on a more personal basis and you know my wife she's like hey I want a quilt well guess who we're gonna go to for a quilt now it's like the lady that says this is what I do I do quilts so it just was a no-brainer to and and it, the video thing is huge because you know the reason she wanted to do quilts is because we actually saw it we saw it on video. And so this is so important for content creators is the more videos you can get up, we can actually see what it is that you do and build that no like and trust factor so quickly. And uh, 2020 has been that year of content, getting that video content up. Man, that's a cool story, Monty. Man, it's it's really it's been cool to to chat with you on the show, and then also just to see you since the last time we we chatted. I mean, just to see your channel continue to grow and you know, we're, you know, I'm excited to see where, where it goes in the future as you continue to, to kind of hone your craft at this. So it's really awesome to chat with you, man. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. I uh, appreciate you. Thank you for the invitation, man. Um, definitely. We're going to stay connected, man, because uh, 2020, you know, coming to a close here soon. And then 2021, um, I'm definitely looking for some big things to happen. I'll definitely keep you updated and in the loop and, you know, provide value as much as possible. Awesome. Then that means we'll have to do a round two at some point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Monty. Thanks again to Monty for coming on the show. If you want to learn more about him, if you want to check out his content, got links to everything that he's working on in the podcast show notes, as well as the YouTube video description. And if you enjoyed this interview, please make sure to leave a review if you have the time, wherever it is that you are tuned into podcasts. It's awesome to hear from you and hear your feedback on what we're working on. And also, please subscribe to our email list. It's really the easiest way to stay up to date on everything that we're working on in association with the Video Craft Show. So until next time, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you.